Hello everyone, hope you're all well, staying safe at home and having a relaxing Mother's Day. Thanks for joining me tonight as we are very excited to premiere just for you the full uncut 2018 induction of Bon Jovi into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It was an honor to be part of that ceremony and we had one hell of a time that night. And now we get to relive it all with you. Our walks down memory lane, our moments of gratitude are Howard, and of course the performances. And we're talking about our whole time on stage at the ceremony. So even if you caught the HBO broadcast a couple years back, we've got even more in store for you. Later this week, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame will keep rolling out more great moments from that 2018 night. Before we get started, we want to say thank you to all the mothers, wives, daughters, and families out there. To show our appreciation to you, I'm going to share a couple of the notes received from you. This one's from Lynn Williams. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. You taught me how to be strong and always stand tall. That when you fall down, you get back up and you keep going. To laugh and love life. You are my inspiration. I love you always. This one's from Shelby Shoemaker. To Tracy, the strongest woman I know, happy Mother's Day, Mom. This is from Deanna Makita. To my mom, you're my strength, my world, and my heart. I wouldn't be the capable, amazing mother I am if it weren't for you. I love you endlessly. This one's from Darian Cahill. Mom, thanks for not only raising us to be Bon Jovi fans, but to always be the best we can be. Happy Mother's Day. And last from Julie Emile. Happy Mother's Day, Marlene Scarano. So now it's time to turn it up, get out of your seats, go crazy. You're in isolation, but we're going to have a good time together. We're going to get through this pandemic and we're going to have a great night. So relive this moment and we can't wait to see you out there on the road. This is David Bryan of Bon Jovi. See ya. Please welcome the king of all media, Howard Stern. Thank you. Wow. By the way, that was 1987. I was on a date with Richie Sambora. We met the hottest chick and had a threesome. That's how it all began. Thank you, thank you. You know, I know exactly what you're saying. It sure lo looks like hell has frozen over. The man who never leaves home, me, Howard Stern, is in Cleveland. I never thought it would happen. Now, thank you. Now, another sign of the zombie apocalypse, Jan Wenner finally let Bon Jovi into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. The fuck is wrong with him? Way to go, Jan, Johnny, John, Jan, whatever the fuck your name is. Anyway, Jan, you did it you finally gave this fantastic band their due. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jan is the man in charge, but I'm not sure why. This guy doesn't play a musical instrument. He doesn't have a band, but he did start a great magazine, Rolling Stone. Yeah. And now it's the size of a pamphlet. What a business plan, way to go. I read it in about 30 seconds backstage. Now, Jan required years of pondering to decide if this glorious band that sold over 130 million albums should be inducted. What a tough decision. Gee, I don't know if I should let Bon Jovi in. 130 million albums. That's not such a big deal. Let me give you an idea what the number 130 million means. And it means a lot. Now, the bubonic plague only killed 50 million people. The atom bomb only killed 225,000 people. 625,000 people died in the Civil War. Peanuts compared to 130 million Bon Jovi albums. How uplifting is my speech tonight? Anybody want to hear about the AIDS epidemic or... Uh but you see, even with all of this talk of death and destruction, I'm making a point. And my point is that 130 million is ridiculously big. Try to look at it this way. The average amount of sperm in one ejaculation <laughs> is only 100 million. Bon Jovi beats sperm, ladies and gentlemen. God bless them all. Love them. 
And you know, speaking of sperm, the band Cream sold 35 million records. Blondie sold 40 million records. And these guys got into the Hall of Fame and they didn't have to wait. Jan knew what to do. Let me tell you something, Leonard Cohen used to sit at home beating off at night thinking about selling three million albums, let alone 130 million. Now, I've only just started, Bon Jovi. My friends, these boys are deserving. They are finally getting their due and it's about time. I gotta say, what an honor, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What a place, I love it. Yeah. It's true. The only place you can see Slim Whitman's underpants, Mariah Carey's tampon, and what about that Ike Turner boxing gloves in the glass case? Did you see that? What a glorious collection of junk we have surrounding us tonight. It's an honor to be here tonight for these guys. I've known them since they've started. And aside from the incredible music accomplishments, they are some of the nicest men I ever met. No stupid rock and roll attitude, just humble and gracious. Whenever I would see them over the years, even with multi-platinum success, they each had a smile on their face in a welcoming way, an appreciation for their craft and their fans. In addition to music, their charity work feeding the homeless, helping the American Red Cross, lending a hand to the Special Olympics. That's a rare humility, and I love them for that. A great group, an iconic band. First of all, we've got John Bon Jovi, a great frontman extraordinaire. The very definition of a rock star. Yes, a man who single-handedly destroyed most of the ozone layer in the 80s with Aquanet hairspray. And he's still working on it. The masterful and powerful drums of Tico Torres. You bet. David Bryan, a true showman on keyboards. Alec John Such, what a great bass player. And by the name, John Such, one of the best names in rock and roll. In fact, I've often said the band should have been called John Such, but we know whose ego could not deal with that. Let's be honest, it wasn't gonna happen. And of course, the extraordinary talents of their current bassist, the great Hugh McDonald, who was with John back in the days of Runaway. And last but not least, my friend Richie Sam Borer. Oh yeah, oh yeah. One of the most underrated guitar players in the world, a masterful songwriter, and, and you know this is true, the man with the biggest penis in Bon Jovi. How do I know that? The boys had a measuring contest early on, Richie won, but I don't want to get into the anaconda penis discussion. That isn't, this isn't the right time for that. We're gonna be inducting Richie in the Penis Hall of Fame next week. Hope you all come. Few realize that uh, Mr. Richie Sambora single-handedly considered it his mission to help women who could not get dates to feel better about themselves. <laughs> Over the years, he helped women like Heather Locklear, Cher, Denise Richards, and countless others across the world. Thank you, Richie. I always said, it's a good thing that Richie had a thing for pretty blondes with blue eyes and a nice ass. That's what motivated him to team up with John in the first place and create a fantastic songwriting team. God bless. All right, now, let's get down to business. These boys have worked their asses off. They are cowboys. On a steel horse they rode. Yes, they are wanted. Wanted dead or alive. Dead or alive. It's all the same. Only the names will change, yes. Every day, it seems we're wasting away. Another place where the faces are so cold. I drive all night just to get back home. I'm a cowboy on a steel horse I ride. I'm wanted. Wanted, dead or alive. I said I'm wanted, wanted, dead or alive. <laughs> 
Sometimes I sleep. Sometimes it's not for days. The people I meet always go their separate ways. Sometimes you tell the day by the bottle that you drink. And times when you're all alone, all you do is think, I'm a cowboy. On a steel horse I ride. I'm wanted, wanted, dead or alone. Eat shit, Bob Dylan. Fuck you. That's music. Look, this is an honor long overdue. I don't think you can go anywhere in this world without hearing a classic Bon Jovi tune somewhere, and it's pretty incredible, their whole success story. Starts out with John getting a job from his uncle, Melvin Bon Jovi. John swept the floors of the legendary recording studio, The Power Station. Yes, John is the world's most successful janitor. John had a job to do. It sucked cleaning up after rock stars, but someone had to do it. Years later, John was replaced by a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and John paid his dues and worked on his music while cleaning the cum off the power station couch. <laughs> I'll share this with you. He told me that I think it was Harry Chapin's jizz was particularly hard to get. But I, I won't talk about that now. That's John. He'll tell you this later. And then John wrote a song called Runaway. She's a little runaway. You know that song? And then he got signed by a label. And he needed a band, so he teamed up with these great guys that we honor here tonight. And they played everywhere, and they recorded music during the next couple of years. According to Richie Sambora, the band was virtually broke when they started recording the album 7,800 Degrees Fahrenheit. They were living together in the same apartment in Philadelphia and sleeping on the floor when it was 12 degrees below zero outside. They only had John's hair and Tico's farts to keep them warm all night. Now that's paying your dues, baby. And the band was struggling when they next released Slippery When Wet. The boys were opening for the band, yeah, 38 Special in Iowa when the album hit. It rapidly rose to the top of the Billboard charts and was the best-selling album of 1987. Yes, John's philosophy, don't bore us, get to the chorus, work like a charm. Shot through the heart and you're to blame. Baby, you give love a bad name. Living on a prayer cane. Then wanted dead or alive burned up the charts and the hits kept coming. Raise your hands, which is still an anthem at all their live shows today. Bad medicine, I'll be there for you. These five words, I swear to you. Lay your hands on me. Lay your hands on me. It's my life, it's now or never. I ain't gonna live forever. Who says you can't go home and on and on and on? Other bands from their era have disappeared, yet Bon Jovi continues and grows stronger. In fact, their last four tours have grossed almost a billion dollars. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up. And if I can be emotional for a second, yes, Rock and roll musicians and what they do are really important to me personally. I love all these bands being inducted tonight. Bands like the Moody Blues, who, Jan, you should have done it years ago. Uh, these guys comforted me uh, through many lonely days in high school. And look at this face, you know I was lonely. There was nothing better than putting on headphones and listening to Days of Future's Past. It was fantastic. I love the cars, I love the Dire Straits. I played their music for years on the radio and uh, I always considered it a great privilege to have a job where I could celebrate rock and roll and play the work of these fine musicians. So on behalf of all fans like me who depend on music to help us through our days, I say thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart, Bon Jovi. John, I love you for always making uplifting music and putting a smile on my face. I, truth, I really feel blessed to know you and to have been given this honor of inducting you. And John, I'm glad you asked me to do this even though I fetch about it. I'm just glad you don't have to sit at home throwing darts at pictures of Jan Winner anymore. It's over, Johnny. It's over, Johnny. The dream has been realized. No, not the dream of owning a football team. That was ridiculous. I, 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 poor, your poor wife, Dorothea, sweetest woman alive, 
She almost had a heart attack when she heard that the mansion in Jersey was being traded in for a condo in Buffalo. But I digress, I want to get back to the rock and roll. Yes, the dream has been realized. The dream I'm talking is about is that this great band of brothers are finally joining their fellow musicians in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like the name of their album says, 100 million fans can't be wrong, and I agree. They got to the chorus, they never bored us. I love these guys, and so do you. It's my honor to induct into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Hugh McDonald, Tico Torres, Sir Alec John Such, David Bryan, Richie Sambora, and the one and only John Bon Jovi, the band Bon Jovi. When John Bon Jovi called me up and asked me to be in his band many years ago, I realized, I soon realized how serious he was and he had a vision that he wanted to bring us to. And I am only too happy to have been a part of that vision. Many people here tonight, I know them, I want to thank you, all the managers, agents, PR people, record people, wives, family, Road crew, everyone, I want to thank you all. You know who you are. To be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is such an honor. Thank you. Now to my bandmates. These guys are the best. I could get a little teary here, so bear with me. We had so many great times together, and I just, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for those guys. Love them to death, always will. I'd like to bring up Huey McDonald. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Ooh, look at that. Thank you, Alec. Wow. Uh, first off, to my wife, Kelly, my kids, Morgan and Jake, I love you. And I'm so happy that you're here to share this honor with me. Thank you to my friend and accountant, Gary Haber, who's had my back for over 40 years. Thank you to my friend, Obie O'Brien, who who's been on my back for over 50 years. <laughs> to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, thank you for the induction. To John Bon Jovi, thank you for the inclusion. <laughs> to my brothers in the band, thank you for the inspiration. Thank you, the fans, for your devotion. I'm honored and humbled. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Richard Steven Sambora. Cleveland, Cleveland, Cleveland! The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame! Just think about it when you're a kid. Do you think you can imagine that any of this shit would have went down and it is this good? Because it's that good. And I'm just proud to be working with these guys. And, uh, you know, songs are very profound in a way because you're connecting with humanity. Uh, and then you find out that you have more in common with uh, humanity than, uh, than 
you, everybody is more alike than they are not alike. And we had the privilege. Yeah, especially now in today's world, right? That's really, really important. Because you can't say nothing. You'd be like. So, you know, first, I mean, got to say thank you to everybody in this band because uh, the hardest thing to do, I believe, is to find four guys with yourself that are very, very dedicated and they'll do anything, they'll work hard, they'll go crazy, whatever it took. And we did that for a really long time, so come on. And boy, was it fun. If I wrote a book, it would be the best time I never had. Howard already exclaimed that for me. I want to thank you, Howard, too. And there's so many people to thank that have, you know, in a career as long as we've had, and it's been so blessed and miracles, it's like almost hard to say anything, but I got to thank my mom over there. Because she bonded me. I got to thank my beautiful daughter. Right? You know, uh, everybody. I mean, all the record company presidents that we've been great friends with and we've had a chance to really bond with and uh, do business with and make music with and make people happy all over the world. And I think that, that's what I'm really, really happy about. 130 million records, 34 something million people we played to. Not one of them left without a smile. Miles of smiles in their hearts. And thank you all. And uh, I've got to thank the fans, because without the fans, let's face it, they're the mirror. That was the mirror. Every night we went out and faced a stadium full of that 72,000 mirror fans. They gave us what we needed back. And hopefully we gave them what they needed. Man, thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce the best drummer in the world, in my opinion, and my dear, dear brother, Tico Toy. Oh, good evening. I must tell you that, uh, Howard, thank you very much. The guy's always made me laugh. I'm, I'm short, but I'm, I try to look up to him as much as possible, and I still do even more. Anyway, uh, this is a blessing to be here. I got to thank my, uh, my mom, she and my dad that can't be here. And uh, she backed me as a musician, saying, do what you want to do and play from your heart. She said, promise me you won't get a tattoo. So mom, I love you. Thank you for that. Uh, my dad, Lenny, the jazz drummer in the 30s and 40s, lent me his 1938 Slingling drum set. And that started my career as a drummer. So I'm blessed to be here, not only with some great peers and wonderful musicians and artists, not only from the past, the present, and hope to come a lot in the future. I get to stand on this stage with some of the finest musicians I ever worked with. Richie, for his soul. He's got a warm heart and soul and his great writing. Hugh McDonald for his grease. Because, you know, bass and drums is ham and eggs here. Yeah. Alec, I love Alec. I met him and we played together since I was 16, in 1969. Lost my virginity at his house, as a matter of fact. I love Alex, and if it wasn't for Alex, I don't think I'd be in this band or any of us. He, he was the kingpin. David, master of arms, the funniest man I ever met, genius behind many coats, great playwright, but he's the funniest man I know. That's right, thank you. John Bon Jovi, my singer. When I met John, I immediately knew that he wanted everything I wanted, which was to make people happy. To work harder than 150%. And he's absolutely the best front man I've ever been with, seen, or worked with. 
I love you, baby. I love you. These guys are family, yes, and Howard did reveal some stuff that we went through when we were younger. And uh, the funny thing is we're still together. We have a new roster of young guys. They're not here. Uh, John Shanks, actually they'll be playing with us, but they're not on the stage. But I want to give him a little kudu, John Shanks. <laughs> Phil X. <laughs> Everett Bradley. And uh, they're wonderful. And I think with all this, the fact that this brought us together, not only as human beings and musicians, and be able to play something that we love so much. I thank and I pay homage to all these gentlemen, all the past that, play, that came on this stage, all the future to come. I want to thank my family, my son Hector, Ali, all my family and friends, and especially everybody here and then in the world that's been our backing for the rest of our lives. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'd like to introduce David Bryan. How y'all doing? Tonight is a celebration of a landmark and an incredible musical journey. A celebration of a seven-year-old who took 15 years of piano, classical piano lessons. A celebration of a 17-year-old who, through John's cousin, Butch, who's sitting over there, I joined the Atlantic City Expressway. A celebration of a 21-year-old recording the first Bon Jovi record. And a celebration of a 56-year-old who stands here tonight proud as hell. When we started out, we said we were gonna make it no matter what. Passion and blind faith drove us beyond our wildest dreams. And in 1983, we set out in Tico Station Wagon. It was so glamorous. <laughs> and I said, wow, we're gonna make it now. And then the big tour came, and a real tour bus picked us up at our house. So John, Richie, and myself, we still lived at home with our parents. And Alec and Tico were adults, they had real houses. So the bus picked us up. This bus was worth 20 times more money than my entire house the most amazing shiny bus comes. We said, okay, it's time to go. So I got all my luggage and I brought my bowling ball because I am from Jersey. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not gonna use a lane ball. I need a real bowling ball. So I brought my bowling ball and then Alec brought his bowling ball and Richie brought his bowling ball. So after we picked all our stuff and we had to go back to each of our houses to drop off the freaking bowling balls because there was no room on the bus. We grew up as nobody, but we, came, but we did become somebody. From the streets of New Jersey, to the stages of the world, to my own personal journey to Broadway, and now to Cleveland, to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I want to thank my original brothers, my new brothers who you will see, my beautiful wife, my beautiful kids, our managers, agents, road crews, recording crews, video crews, my friends, and especially all the fans for a great journey that, that continues to surprise and thrive. Thank you. And now, my brother, since we was youths, John Bon Jovi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First, I want to thank Beth Stern for not only getting Howard here, for getting him to stay here. And I want to thank Howard because he is the only man in America that thinks he needed a passport to come to Cleveland. Thank you. My, my dear friend, it is the truth, he was my first my only choice to induct us tonight, and I, I'm, I'm very grateful. I've been writing this speech since I first strummed a broom and sang it from the top of the stairs of my childhood at home. I've actually written it many ways, many times. Some days I write the thank you speech, other days I write the fuck you speech. <laughs> writing it 
was in fact therapeutic for me in a lot of ways. I certainly see things differently tonight than I would have 10, 20, 30 years ago. And in the end, it's all about time. It took a lot of people to get us here tonight, and not all of them were hairstylists and clothing salespersons. <laughs> see, I was first introduced to music at seven years old when my mother brought home a guitar that she had bartered for along with the Kenny Rogers Learn to Play Guitar record. As a kid, my parents took me to lessons where this guy in a little cubicle smoking a pipe, he opened the book to a bunch of scales and he tortured kids with his smoke and his lack of interest. After a couple weeks, I quit, I threw that guitar down the basement stairs, conveniently breaking a tuning peg. That guitar laid there in the dark until I was around 15 and a man named Al Paranello moved into our neighborhood. Al played in the lounges in the wedding circuit. He was a great guy, a family man. He took an interest in a couple of us neighborhood kids and he taught us a couple of songs. Al's teaching style was much different than that of the pipe smoking, scale playing, half hour nap taking session the man at the strip mall gave me. Now, I didn't learn quickly and I was by no means any good, but Al showed me the magic of a song. First it was the animals, the version of House of the Rising Sun. We slogged through that. Then it was Thin Lizzy and the boys are back in town. Truth is, I did a half-assed job at practicing, but I, I went back, and after a couple of weeks, Al lost his cool demeanor, and the hip dad yelled at me. He said, don't waste my fucking time. If you don't know this next week, we're done. It worked, because I've been practicing my craft every single day. <laughs> Al passed away in 1995. The initials AP have been carved on my guitar ever since, and they serve as a reminder to practice every day, and so for that, I say thank you, Al Paranoa. Every kid who ever played in their garage dreams of being in a big rock band, and I was no different. It began in my buddy's basement and in the backyard. We played in the local talent show, came in second place, worked up to block dances, then the clubs where we got a glimpse of what we thought was the big time. At 17, I started a big 10-piece band called the Atlantic City Expressway, playing the songs of my childhood heroes, The Animals and Thin Lizzy, of course, but especially Bruce Springsteen and a lot of Southside John. <laughs> David Bryan was in that band. He used to do his homework in the basement of the fast lane before we'd play our set. And I want to take a moment here to thank David's dad, Big Ed, because I know he's here tonight watching down over us. So thanks, Big Ed, for your van for cheering us on. By 18, I could already see that there were two paths in music. You either play for fun or you play for keeps. The cover band circuit was where the money was, where the girls were, but where the future was not. So I quit my own cover band and I joined an original band as their lead singer. The rest didn't last very long, but I do appreciate Jack Ponte, whose band it was for taking me in and nurturing the earliest me. By the fall of 1980, I was out of high school, I was out of the rest, I was fronting my own band wherever and whenever I could and running errands at a place called the Power Station. The next couple of years were my college. Write, sing, play, watch, learn, repeat. I saw a lot of the men and the women who make up this Hall of Fame walk in and out of those studios. The Stones, Queen, Bowie, Bruce, Dylan, Cher, Chic. I did hand claps on a little Steven record. And I sang on the Star Wars Christmas record. I remember Mark Knopfler, who was dating the studio manager at the time, asking me to borrow a copy of his album, Making Movies. I told him I'd loan it to him if he'd sign it for me. I still have that album and I remain a huge Dire Straits fan. So thank you, Mark and Dire Straits. By 1982, I had written and recorded a bunch of songs, but one of them stood out. It was called Runaway. Yeah. And after sending that cassette to every label, every manager I could think of, I thought, who is the loneliest man in the music business? The DJ. There was a new station in New York City called WAPP. It was so new that there wasn't even a receptionist, so I was able to walk in and get the attention of John Lastman and the DJ, Chip Hobart. I told him about the song on the cassette and the frustration of not getting any label to listen to it. 
Well, Chip did listen, and he told me he thought it should be included on their homegrown record of local music. A few months later, Runaway was playing on the radio not only in New York, but in Tampa, and Chicago, and Detroit, and Denver, and in other markets. Now, I had all the attention I needed, but I needed to showcase the songs. What I needed was a band. So I called David. He was still playing, but he was also going to college to be a doctor, like his nice Jewish mother said he should. I met Alex Such, who was in a cover band called Phantom's Opera. Alec was the coolest cat on the cover circuit scene. He, he was the rock star in his band. Alec was also in an original band called Message with Richie Sambora. They were doing a summer tour supporting Joe Cocker and promoting their own EP. And Alec knew the baddest ass drummer in the land, Tico Torres. I swear, back at the fast lane, I once watched Tico beat a drum to death. He was the hardest hitting sledgehammer I had ever seen. Tico was already a married man, had a house, was in a band called Frankie and the Knockouts, was already on the road with a record deal and hit singles, and I needed to convince him to give that up, to rehearse in a storefront, and play with a 21-year-old version of me. Part of me thought, no chance. The rest of me was pretty confident. So that Sunday, I went to his house and I played him the songs. I told him about the radio exposure and I hoped that he might help me out. Tico took a shot and I've been his singer ever since. So David, Tico, Alec, and Snake Sabo, who uh, went on to form Skid Row and was helping me out at the time, agreed to do a couple of these promotional shows. And one night, at the Fountain Casino in Aberdeen, New Jersey, Alec invited Richie Sambora to come and see us play. Richie came backstage and we hit it off. Legend has it, he told me that he was gonna be in the band. And I said, well, let's get together and write a bit. Let's see if our styles worked. Let's see if it works for the vision. It didn't take me but a minute to realize that Richie was a great singer, a great writer, and a great player. And it didn't take him too long to agree to join us. The success of Runaway led to a deal with Polygram that I signed in 1983 and the label remains our home to this day. With a band at my side, a record deal in place, and a song on the radio, it was time to look for a manager. Several of them showed interest, each offering something unique. But Doc McGee just wanted it more. And I remember back in 83 going into a record store with him talking about music looking at album sleeves and touring programs we talked about my influences and the big names of the day like van halen like journey he told me we could be like them only bigger he believed it i believed him i signed that deal the record came out in 1984 and runaway cracked the top 40. we toured the u.s with the scorpions and then we went to europe with kiss and then on to japan for the first time with white snake we learned how to win over a crowd that doesn't know your name, doesn't know your songs, or even understand your language, all in 40 minutes or less. So to all of us, to all of those who allowed us to open for you and to learn from you along the way, I say thank you. In 85, a second record, a couple of top 40 hits, another year on the road, another uh, American Gold record, set us up for the Make or Break third album, Slippery When Wet. That record, would change our lives. There was the magic combination of our band, Bruce Fairburn, Bob Rock, Desmond Child, our A&R guy, Derek Schulman, Doc, a little known studio called Little Mountain in the city of Vancouver. <laughs> Nothing would ever be the same. You give love a bad name, wanted dead or alive, living on a prayer. We started having consistent hits and we finally became a headliner. And everyone that was involved in that record and the tour brought out the best in each other. Many millions of records and hundreds of shows later came the New Jersey album and another five top 10 singles. Millions more records, hundreds more shows, same, same team, same results. They say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It almost killed us. But we live to become stronger, so thank you to all of those who helped write that chapter. To Bruce Fairburn, who produced Slippery and New Jersey, thank you for your trust, your faith, your, tr your patience, and your kindness. Your memory lives every time that we hear those records. And thank you, Doc McGee, for teaching us the ropes. Doc, you were our Colonel Parker and P.T. Barnum rolled into one. By 1992, 
Rock music got the kick in the teeth that it needed with the Seattle scene. The grunge movement was, turning, was a turning point in many of my peers' careers. The big happy anthems of the hedonistic 80s had gone out of style. And there were many of you out there who'd figured that we'd be gone with it. Then I opened Bon Jovi Management with Paul Corzelius. Self-management certainly wasn't the most fashionable statement an artist could make, but thanks to Paul, BJM had a pretty good 25-year run. As time marched on, Keep the Faith reinvents the band. We continue having hits, and now we're playing the biggest stadiums in the world. Alec leaves the band, and Hugh McDonald joins the tour. As the 90s wind down, we're right in the next chapter of our career. We ring in the new century and introduce ourselves to a new generation with It's My Life and the Crush record, followed by Bounce. In 2005, Jack Rovner joins the team and he challenges the status quo. With Jack's help, the band wins a Grammy and plants the seeds for what ultimately becomes the JBJ Soul Foundation. John Shanks also enters the picture as our producer, collaborator, support system, and on Have a Nice Day, Richie and I go on to write Who Says You Can't Go Home. We're the first rock band to have a number one country single. And then it's three more number one albums in a row. Lost Highway, The Circle, What About Now? Things are actually going incredibly well. So if this was one of those behind the music episodes, this is where the shit hits the fan. <laughs> so during the Because We Can tour, Richie's no longer standing at my side. Once again, Phil X has to answer his phone and answer the call. Tico has not one, but two emergency surgeries and we have to actually have a replacement drummer sit in for 11 stadium shows. One night I'm looking out at 80,000 faces at Rock and Rio. I turn to David and I think, holy shit, I'm back in a cover band. Hugh, now Phil, eventually Tico, David and I play another 105 shows and still manage to have the year's highest grossing tour. By 2014, 2015, I'm dealing with record company turmoil as well as the unexpected departure of my creative partner and guitar player. Then it's Jerry Edelstein, my rock, my lawyer, and my godfather. He gets ill and he has to retire. There was so much loss during this time, my voice had no interest in working for me any longer. I swear even my guitar gave me the finger. So to paraphrase <laughs> Malcolm X, my wife reminded me that there is no better lesson than adversity. And I sought help anywhere I could find it. Professional as well as spiritual guides in the form of my angels, Katie Agresta, Mary Jo Dupree, John Shanks, Steve Thaxton, Steve Grillo, Steve Cohen, Lou Cox, they all helped put me back together again. So when we went back in the studio in the spring of 2016, there was a renewed sense of pride and purpose. We ended up recording at the same studio where I used to be a gopher back in 1980. The same studio where I signed the record deal in Polygram with 1983 and where we extended that deal in 2015. And this time, just like the first time, there was an exuberance and a joy that was put into every single note that there was because there was a feeling of a band working together with something to say. This House Is Not For Sale was a band record. David. He stepped up and he filled the creative and emotional gaps that were left behind. Lemma, you've always been there for me, but on this record, you were doubly there, and I thank you, my brother. Tico, Hugh, Phil, Billy Falcon, they all poured their hearts into this record. John Shanks produced every note of this record with pride and with urgency to deliver for me what I needed, what I wanted, what we stood for. This house is not for sale enters the charts at number one. And that brings us here amongst the class of 2018 and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So all I can say is congratulations and thank you to all the artists for their memories and inspiration. To all of you who have been a part of this incredible ride for the last 35 years and to all the fans who supported this band, we share this honor with you because this life is a gift. None of it possible without all of you guiding us. There are so many of you here that I want to hug and I want to kiss and I want to say thank you to. First, my parents. Without my parents, there wouldn't be me. 
to my brothers, Matt and Tony, who have always stood by my side, to Jerry Edelstein, my godfather, my protector, Charles Sussman, who has now had to fill those big shoes, to Paul Corzelius, the one man that I'd want in the foxhole with me. Thank you, Paulie. To Obi O'Brien, my best friend, loyal, confident, and happiest Eagles fan on earth. <laughs> to Mike Rue, our right-hand man for the last 20 years who has given me his best every single day. Desmond Child, my friend, you taught me many, many things along the way. Thank you for your talents. Billy Falcon, also my dear friend, my collaborator, thank you for being the quintessential songwriter. To Irving Azoff, thank you, Irving, for taking the reins and believing in us, because I know that you truly are the Wizard of Oz. David Massey, Eric Wong, you've always believed in us and you supported us at Island Records. To our family of 35 years, I thank you. I thank Ken Sunshine and Tiffany Ship, aside from teaching me key, key Yiddish words like mensch and schmuck. You're the tag team who has always kept the word out there and always been keeping my word. John Sykes, my friend, your unwavering support throughout my career is without compare. Robert Norman, Allison McGregor, Chris Dalston, and all at CAA, but especially Rob Light, who just refused to take no for an answer. You fought for this. You've delivered throughout my career, and you've been in my corner, being my agent over 25 years. To my kids, Stephanie, Jesse, Jacob, and Romeo, you are my greatest hits. I love you all. And to my wife, Dorothea, you're my everything. You're the greatest gift that God could have given me. You're there whenever I breathe, and I just want to make your tea and tell you how much I love you forever. All right, finally, the end of my speech. I know, I know. It's about time. And that has been the theme of our weekend. So it all really just depends on how you read into those words. It's about time because time is the most precious commodity we have. I thank my lucky stars for the time that I got to spend with each one of you. Alec, Richie, Hugh, Tico, David. To you, to us, to all of you. Tonight, the band that agreed to do me a favor stands before you so I can say thank you for making this dream a reality. Somebody take me to the sea.
Don't be afraid of them He'll remember when Down on the dead. 